Okay, Arnold Frichtenbaum is going to come speak to us, but I don't know about you, but he's my Rebbe. <laughs> and, uh, of course, then he, he asked me, well, if I'm your Rebbe, how come I don't send money to him? <laughs> right? Because that's what you do with your rabbi. You send money to him, right? I'm still waiting. He's waiting. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, he's going to talk about replacement theology and the epistle of 1 Peter because uh, 1 Peter 2, for example, is a commonly used argument to argue for replacement theology. And so you can see uh, some kind of theme developing here in this conference if you're really observant, uh, you know, dealing with re replacement theology. But Dr. Frichtenbaum is head of Ariel Ministries, that uh, a Jewish evangelism and discipleship ministry. So he's going to start us off with at least one rabbi story. So here you go. I wasn't going to do that, but he asked me to do that before I got up here. And I didn't write down all the rabbi stories I've already told you in the past. I'm not sure what I told you or what I didn't tell you, so I think this might be a new one. And as, as you know, the Jewish community around the world has a reputation for being rather intelligent. And this is true. <laughs> but there's one place in Poland called Helm, spelled C-H-E-L-M. And the Jewish community of Helm is noted for not being too intelligent. In fact, there are a lot of stories about the wise men of Helm. If you go to a Jewish bookstore, you'll see some of these books. The best one is by Isaac Besheva Singer, called The Wise Men of Helm. And while Jews elsewhere in the world learn to think logically through Talmudic studies, the Jews of Helm long, long learned to think logically by telling each other riddles. So what was the wise men of Helm? A wise man of Helm was someone who could tell riddles nobody else could solve and he could solve every little brought to him, and the wisest and the smartest man in Helm was the rabbi of Helm. Every rabbi, every riddle brought to him he could solve, but he could also tell us riddles nobody else could solve. He also had this great desire to visit New York City. This was back in the late 50s, early 60s. The Jewish community in New York City was even larger than the Jewish community of Israel of those days. The most famous rabbis, rabbinic schools, and so on, were all in the city of New York City. The Jewish community in Helm raised some funds to send the rabbi for one month trip to New York City. Landed in the JFK airport, he was uh, met by a New York taxi driver who was assigned to bring him to the Jewish community. It was about an hour and a half drive to where he was going, and so it began a discussion. And the taxi driver asked the rabbi, would you like to hear a riddle? Rabbi said, do I want a riddle? Back where I live, that's all we do all day, and I am the most famous riddle solver in all of my town in Helm. You tell me a riddle, I will solve it. The New York taxi driver said, all right, here's the riddle. My parents had a child, but this child was not my brother nor my sister. Who could this child be? Rabbi was thinking, trying to solve it, and after a while, they were getting close to us to leave the taxi. He finally said, well, I'm usually very good at this, but I've never had such a hard riddle, and I have to give up. Who was this child your parents had that was not your brother, not your sister? A New York taxi driver said, the answer is me. I'm the child my parents had that was not my brother, I'm not my sister. <laughs> Rabbi said, what a wonderful riddle. I can't wait to get back to my hometown and tell my people that riddle. They will love this riddle. After an exciting month, he returned. When the first uh, Sabbath came, even the Jews who did not attend synagogue services regularly all went out to find out how what his adventures were. What rabbis did he meet? What rabbinic schools did he get to visit? He got behind the poem. He said, I'll give you a day by the account. When I was in America, I heard this tremendous riddle. Would you to hear it first? And he said, oh, yes, we have not heard a good riddle since you left us a month ago. What is the riddle? My parents had a child, and this child was not my brother nor my sister. Who could this child be? And all this noise broke out. They were discussing back and forth, trying to solve it. But as time went on, the noise got lower and lower, and finally dead quiet. The spokesman said, Rabbi, we tried to figure it out on ourselves and by ourselves, but we cannot do it. Who was the child your parents had that was not your brother, not your sister? And the rabbi said, it was a New York taxi driver that I met back in America. <laughs> <laughs> I 
At the end, I may tell you another one from hell. <laughs> the topic, as you can see from the top, is replacement theology in the epistle of 1 Peter. There's more material in this um, paper that's in your disk than I can do within the framework of our time here. But I will read certain segments of it. I will summarize other segments of it so we can get through the whole material in allotment of time, and then we still should have time for questions and answers. Now, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, the first epistle of Peter begins with information about the author, the recipients, and their location. The author is Peter, who identifies himself as an apostle. The original Greek does not contain an article and therefore emphasizes the qualitative nature. As an apostle, he had the authority of the shepherd over the sheep. This is the third of the five Hebrew Christian and Messianic Jewish epistles, and these five epistles are written to meet specific needs of the Jewish believers who were scattered as a result of the persecution that rose after the death of Stephen. The apostles initially stayed in Jerusalem, hence um, when the Jewish believers were scattered, they became a sheep without a shepherd. These epistles were written to instruct the sheep by a letter rather than by means of personal instruction. Later, Peter left the land to join those of the dispersion and arrived in Babylon, which in that day was the center of Judaism outside the land. Peter uses three terms to describe the recipients of his letter. First of all, they are elect, meaning they were chosen by God. The Greek word, and the, secondly, they were sojourners, and the Greek word for sojourners means alien nationality and temporary resident. As Jewish believers living outside the land, living alongside pagan Gentiles, these sojourners were considered to be resident aliens. And thus the term sojourner describes their relationship to the world. Third, recipients are of the dispersion. The word dispersion remains to this day a technical Jewish term to refer to Jews living outside the land. This word is used twice elsewhere, John 7.35 and James 1.1, in this case, the reference is not to all Jews, but only to those Jewish believers living outside the land. They are twice distinguished from the Gentiles among whom they live. Some commentators attempt to deny the Jewishness of the book, claiming that in the usage of the word Gentiles, Peter means non-believers. Paul does use that term that way, it's in 1 Corinthians 12 too, in a context where that meaning is obvious. But even Paul uses it, the term primarily to mean a non-Jew and there is no exegetical basis for such a conclusion in this passage. The meaning is not consistent with normal usage found elsewhere in the New Testament. The word Gentile should be understood in its common primary meaning as a reference to non-Jews. Thus, Peter is writing specifically to the remnant of Israel, the Jewish believers of that day. The word church does not appear in the epistle at all. Replacement theologies such as covenant theology try desperately to avoid the normal usage of the term, of the terms such as dispersion and Gentile, in order to prove the church is Israel and therefore they redefine these terms. The following quotes are some examples. The first quote comes from Wayne Gruden. The dispersion, diaspora, was a term used by Greek-speaking Jews to refer to Jewish people scattered throughout the nations dispersed from their homeland, Israel. Here in James 1.1, 1, 1, dispersion refers to Christians, but this does not imply that Peter was writing only to Jewish Christians. Rather, the term here has a new spiritual sense of referring to Christians dispersed throughout the world and living away from their heavenly homeland, yet hoping someday to reach it. The word thus reinforces the meaning of sojourners and adds the idea that they are part of a world wide scattering of Christians. And then you have some other quotes that you have in your paper, but the emphasis is the same. They, for the most part, they admit that the other two usages that's used normally for Jews outside the land, but for First Peter, they want to make it more allegorical or spiritualizing it to refer to Christians in general and claim that Peter's writing primarily to Gentiles but using Jewish terminology to describe their state. Later on, we read, um, Peter writes to those who are sojourners of the diaspora. The Jews had used the term dispersion, diaspora, to refer to the scattered communities outside Palestine ever since the exile. It appears several times in the New Testament with this meaning. Here in Peter, we find a natural transfer 
are one of the titles of Israel to the church. As we will frequently later, the church consists of communities of people living outside their native land, which is not Jerusalem or Palestine, but the heavenly city. These people owe their loyalty to that city from which they expect to receive their king, that their life on earth is temporary and that they do not belong is underlined by the use of the term sojourners. They are pilgrims, foreigners, those who belong to, the, to heaven, and they pass time on earth but belong as citizens in heaven. Perhaps the most unusual thing about Christians to which he wrote is that they were largely Gentile. And uh, he gives several verses citing them and then says it is simply not uh, possible that these verses could refer to, uh, to Jewish people. How David's conclusions that these verses can apply to Jews escapes me. For example, the Old Testament verses quoted in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, clearly refer to Israel. Now, skip the next quote. However, a few European theologians recognize the Jewishness of the epistle. And I quote In some of these places, the apostle Paul had preached into others, such as Bithynia, Pontus, and possibly Cappadocia. The Holy Spirit had not permitted him to enter. But Peter was not writing particularly to converts Paul had made. It is mainly the Jews that Peter had in mind. For them applies the word dispersion. There may have been local congregations, almost or entirely composed of Jewish Christians. Undoubtedly, there were individual Jewish Christians surrounded by Gentiles, non-believing Jews. Whatever the racial complexion of these churches and localities may have been, regardless of a verse or two that seems to refer to Gentiles, Peter addresses the Jews. After that, you have some other quotations. And then we come to a section, unfortunately, even some dispensationalists tend to identify the readers with the church in general. And you have um, the first quote, the first paragraph I'll uh, skip. Second paragraph says, Though God called Peter to be the apostle to the Jews, the absence of the definite article with the diaspora argues that Peter was not addressing Jews as such in his salutation. Next paragraph. The early status of the readers is further described by the added genitive of the dispersion. The term supplements the thought of their alien status. It indicates that Peter's readers were scattered a uh, scattered minority group. The dispersion was a standard Jewish way to refer to Jews living among the Gentiles outside of their Palestinian homeland, John 7, 35. In James 1, 1, the expression of 12 tribes which are of dispersion most likely refers to Jewish Christians outside of Palestine. Those who believe that Peter 2 is writing to Jewish Christians understand the term to confirm their position. The lack of a definite article and the failure to mention the 12 tribes detract the, the from the alleged parallel with James 1.1. 1, 1. It seems more natural to understand Peter's use of the term metaphorically as a picture of Christians scattered in various areas as a minority group in a non-Christian world. Now, skipping the next quote, it is true that a lack of a definite article before the non emphasizes the nature of the object rather than the object itself, but does not change the content of the object. For example, the same passage, the word apostle does not have the definite article either, but it does not change the content that Peter was indeed an apostle, and in fact, he was the apostle to the circumcision. By the same token, the absence of the definite article before dispersion, while emphasizing its nature, does not change the content. The epistle is addressed to Jewish believers outside the land. And, um, and although people, dispensation like Heber, do take the views of is referring to the church, he does argue against replacement theology. He says in one the segment of his commentary, he lands him back over the last two verses, one cannot escape the impression that Peter clearly intended to establish a parallel between Israel and the church. That parable is discernible in each of the three areas just considered. The four designations of the corporate identity of the church were all drawn from designations applied to Israel in the Old Testament. Then the paragraph, he however, says it does not naturally follow from the parallel between Israel and the church that Peter believed that the church has permanently replaced Israel. 
the latter will not again enjoy a separate existence under the favor of God. Israel's future is inseparably connected with its acceptance of faith of the returning Messiah. Now skipping the next quote, other dispensationalists, however, do recognize that Peter was specifically writing to Jewish believers. One example is William Baker. He writes, First Peter was written just as the early church came near the threshold of violent persecution. The book is addressed to aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia who are chosen. These were probably descendants of Jewish Christians who had been living in Asia Minor, now the region of modern Turkey, who had made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem and were witness, witnesses to dramatic events of Pentecost. When they returned, they must have shared with the great enthusiasm about the risen Christ. It is not inconceivable that the audience Peter was writing to was mainly Jewish. Though the doctrine of the church was by now fully developed, bringing together both Gentiles and Jews into the spiritual body of Christ, but still seems fair to say that this apostle was focusing his ministry with the scattered Jewish communities of believers throughout the Mediterranean basin. Howard Baker does apply chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 to the church, but rejects replacement theology. Now, skipping his first paragraph, the third paragraph says, In what sense do the ideas of a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession apply to the church today? If the church is distinct from Israel, why does Peter use language that points to identity as replacement theologians claim? Part of the answer is that there are similarities between the church and Israel, but there are more dissimilarities than similarities, and that forms part of the basis for the dispensational viewpoint. Kenneth Wiest also recognized the Jewishness of the epistle. He writes, the word scarred is from diasporas, the word is found in the Septuagint, where Moses says of Israel, you shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. It's probably the earliest example of its use as a technical designation for Jews who, for whatever reason, lived outside of Palestine. The word is used in John 7.35 and James 1.1 1, 1 in both places, referring to those Jews who live outside of Palestine. Peter uses it the same way. We thus see the recipients of the letter were Christian Jews. And these Jews were living among the Gentiles in the various provinces named by Peter, all of which were in Asia Minor. What signifies the term Gentiles meaning the unsaved world? And the word Gentiles, he says, is from the Greek word referred, referred here not to Gentiles as in the contrast to Jews, but the unsaved world, the world of people without Christ. Among dispensational study Bibles, both Schofield and New Schofield recognized the recipients of the to be Jewish believers. And in the old Schofield, it says the epistle of Peter is the fulfillment of the commission given to Peter by Christ in Luke 22. Peter was a minister to the Jews. As he writes to the dispersed Jews, he is the apostle of hope. Like Paul, Peter sets forth the doctrines of grace. There are a number of parallels in this letter to the words of the Lord recorded in the Gospels. Also, there are resemblances between the language of this epistle and speeches of Peter and Acts. First, Peter is written from Babylon. Geographical notations in 1.1 1, 1 agree with, the, with Babylon's the center writing. However, many understand the name to be a symbol of Rome. The letter is addressed to Hebrew Christians and with uh, wider, uh, wider applications to all believers in Christ. I also gave you a quote New Schofield, which is pretty much the same as the old one with a few changes of wording. And Charles Rari, with whom I rarely disagree with and would be afraid to disagree with, <laughs> sees Peter writing primarily to Gentiles. And in his uh, study Bible, this letter, readership, this letter is addressed to aliens, aliens scattered, or literally, the sojourners of dispersion. These were Christians who, like Israel of old, were scattered throughout the world, uh, though the readers of this epistle were predominantly of Gentile rather than Jewish background. So the, uh, the essence of the first argument, first based upon the first two verses, is does Peter use the word dispersion in its normal language, that the way the Jewish people use it this day, 
for Jews outside the land, or does he use it symbolically? Nothing implies a symbolic usage of what he says. Now, First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. In verse 18, Peter emphasized the redemption. He begins by positively addressing the fact that ye were redeemed. The word redeemed means to pay ransom. Third evidence is found in 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. In verse 18, these believers were redeemed from the vain man of life, which would have been Pharisaism. They're redeemed from Mishnaic Judaism, which is a Judaism handed down from your fathers. A very typical Jewish term, by the way, was handed down by tradition. And although one of the replacement theologians says this shows he could not have written to Jews, that phrase points to a Jewish audience. The vain man of life handed down from your fathers, which would have been a reference to Mishnaic Judaism. This too is a typical Jewish statement referring to traditions passed down by rabbis or sages or fathers. These are the traditions of the oral legends of the Mishnah. In the past, these traditions always had and the present continue to have a strong pull on the Jewish people. Peter points out that regardless of how old these traditions are, their antiquity does not prove the correctness of any opinion or doctrine. These Jewish believers have been redeemed, but not with silver or gold. In verse 19, he continues by using the positive approach regarding the issue of redemption by stating the price, the blood of the Messiah. His blood was precious, was of high value because Jesus was the Lamb of God. Peter emphasizes Jesus the Passover lamb as a lamb without spot, without blemish. The Passover connection made by Peter also points to the Jewishness of his audience. Systematic theologies have largely failed to include an Israelology, though they always have a section on ecclesiology. This is understandable for all replacement theologies, including covenant theology, but it is not understandable for dispensationalism with consistent distinction between Israel and the church. A key subdivision of a complete Israelology would include the concept of the remnant of Israel. It is that concept that is crucial in understanding what Peter is referring to, especially in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Now we come to the remnant of Israel. The doctrine of the remnant means that within the Jewish nation as a whole, there is always some who believe, and all those who believe among Israel comprise the remnant of Israel. The remnant of Israel, any point of history, might be large or small, but there was never a time when it's non existent. Only believers comprise the remnant, but not all believers are part of the remnant. The remnant is a Jewish remnant and is therefore comprised of Jewish believers. Furthermore, the remnant is always part of the nation as a whole and not detached from the nation as a separate entity. The remnant is distinct, but distinct within the nation. Now the origin. The concept of the remnant of Israel is true from the very beginning of Israel's history as they began to multiply. As a doctrine, the theology of the remnant begins with the prophets and developed, um, development of the doctrine continues through the New Testament. The historical event that gave rise to the doctrine involves Elijah the prophet. Because of this was idolatry in the worship of Baal, God sent a drought upon a nation as a divine discipline, a drought announced by Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. What happened in chapter 17 is that um, God used Elijah to announce the coming of a severe drought upon the land for the sinfulness of worshiping the god Baal that was brought into the country by Jezebel, the wife of Ahab. And um, upon that, he's then sent to simply hide by the brook Karit. And uh, within the Elijah account, you have a contrast between the miraculous, the non-miraculous, the noise, and the quiet. And the miraculous, non-miraculous, you see with his experience in the city, in the brook Karit, God provides the water naturally through the brook, but the food is brought on miraculously by means of ravens. When the drought gets so severe, the brook dries up, and of course, God could easily work another miracle to provide water for Elijah. For 40 years, he provided water miraculously for two million people in the desert. He could only divide, uh, provide miraculously water for one man, but God would not always do with the miraculous. He sends him to the very place that Jezebel came from, the land of Sidon. 
a result of his experience in Sidon. While Jews are worshiping the god Baal, a Sidonian god, Sidonians begin to worship the God of Israel, the Lord, Jehovah himself. And then chapter 18, he's sent back in the land of uh, Israel, and he has his famous contest with the prophets of Baal. And there you see the contrast between the noise and the quiet. The prophets of Baal are noisy, but the prayer of Elijah is quiet. And while the prophets of Baal get noisier, the heavens stay silent. And after Elijah's quiet prayer, the heavens get noisy, and Elijah's sacrifices was burned up. Then comes the crucial chapter, chapter 19. And after being threatened by Jezebel, he, is, he gets so depressed, he runs away from Israel, goes down to Judah, goes down to Beersheba, the southern end of Judah. He leaves his servant there, and he goes into a day's journey, and he falls asleep under a juniper tree, asking the God to put him to death. He's not afraid to die. He won't be put to death by Jezebel. Be so depressed he wants uh, to die and ask God to put him to death. And that's not the irony of his account because as far as I know, he's the only prophet that asked him to put him to death. And God said, never. He's alive to this day. Never died yet. But instead, he's woken up by an angel and he's given a piece of cake to eat. He takes out that cake, has a second nap, and then God gives him a second piece of cake, or the angel does. And that's the biblical basis for angel food cake, and you're wondering. <laughs> I haven't found devil's food cake yet, but I'm still looking. And finally, there was a, it was a two fine pieces of cake, no salt, no sugar, no cholesterol. It's sufficient to sustain them for 40 days of walking in hot desert territory right down to Mount Sinai, where God made a covenant with Israel, and God um, and Israel committed itself not to worship any other God, a commitment that was now rapidly breaking up. And there God asked them, what's with you here, Elijah? And Elijah's answer is um, to issue an indictment against Israel in chapter 19, verse 10. And he said, I've been very jealous for Jehovah, the God of Israel, the God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, um, slain your prophets with the sword, I and I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now, this is a severe indictment against Israel by a prophet who suffered and struggled to bring nation repentance, but to no avail. And this type of indictment, if true, required a divine discipline. And God's response is spelled out in chapter 19, verse 11 through 13. And God's response was to send three noisy things which did not contain the presence of God, and the fourth thing, a quiet thing, which did contain the presence of God, the still small voice. This contained God's presence, so Elijah wrapped up his face in his mantle. A natural Jewish response, as this was a common Jewish reaction, whenever one thought he might be present in the presence of God. Now God again asked him, what's with you here, Elijah? Elijah again issued the same indictment against Israel he did before. And God's answer now comes in verses 11 through um, 13. And the parallel 11 13 should not be missed. In response to Elijah's indictment against Israel, God sends three noisy things against Israel. And while he sends all three things, God's presence is not in them. The first is Hazael, the king of Syria. Hazael corresponds to the wind. And just as the wind beat against a mountain, Hazel will beat against Israel until he reduces Israel's holdings considerably. Jehu corresponds to the earthquake. As the earthquake split the mountain, Jehu will cause a civil war which will totally destroy the dynasty and house of Ahab, as well as the royal members of the house of Judah. Elisha corresponds to the fire. And just as the fire burned against the mountain, Elisha burned against Israel. And often where Israel went, death followed. God indeed sent all these three noisy things, but God's presence was not in them. God then tells Elijah that he was not the only one left that was faithful, for God had 7,000 others, and these 7,000 were the remnant of that day. Quite small compared to nation as a whole, the remnant corresponds to a still small voice. A remnant in contrast to Hazel, Jehu, and Elisha is the quiet thing. So quiet, Elijah did not even know they existed since twice he said he was the only one left. And God's presence was within among the remnant. 
It was with this historical remnant of 7,000 of Elijah's day with which the doctrinal remnant of Israel began. And scriptures deal with the remnant doctrine, past, present, and future. Now Isaiah and the remnant. It's Isaiah the prophet who put the remnant concept into theological terms. It's mostly found in the unit comprising chapters 7 through 12 called the Book of Emmanuel, since in the Hebrew text, the name of it is found three times. Building on the contrast of the noise and the quiet, he points out that non-remnant tends to put its trust in that which is noisy, the tsunami, but remnant has a quiet confidence in the God of Israel and the one to come, Emmanuel. Ultimately, the noise will destroy the non-remnant, which puts its faith in the noise, but Emmanuel will save the believing. Emmanuel thus becomes the point of division between the remnant and the non-remnant. For the remnant, the manual proved to be a sanctuary. For the non-remnant, the manual proved to be a stone of stumbling rock of offense. Remnant places trust in the law and the prophets, and therefore waits upon the Lord. So important was the doctrine of the remnant to Isaiah, he had named one of his sons Shar Yeshu, which means a remnant shall return. With that naming, Isaiah was looking forward to the future, final salvation of the remnant of Israel. Until then, it is God who will protect the remnant and guarantee its survival. The Israel of God of Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. The purpose of this section is to present a dispensational view of Galatians 6, 16, the only passage produced by all kinds of theologians as evidence that the church is the spiritual Israel or that the Gentile believers become spiritual Jews. The verse does not prove the case. The passage reads, as many as shall walk by this rule, peace be upon them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. The book of Galatians is concerned with Gentiles who are attempting to attain salvation and or sanctification through the law. The ones deceiving them were Judaizers who were Jews demanding adherence to the law of Moses. Then a Gentile had to convert to Judaism before he qualified for salvation through Christ. In verse 15, Paul states that the important thing for salvation is faith, resulting in the new man. He also mentions two elements, circumcision and uncircumcision. And so refers to the two groups of the people, Jews and Gentiles, two groups already mentioned by those very terms back in chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. In verse 16, Paul then pronounces a blessing on members of the two groups that would follow this rule of salvation through faith alone. The first group is the them, the uncircumcision, the Gentile Christians, two of whom he had been devoting most of the epistle. The second group is the Israel of God. These are the circumcision, the Jewish believers who, in contrast with the Judaizers, follow the rule of salvation by grace through faith alone. Conclusions must ignore the primary meaning of, the, of kind, which separates the two groups in the verse in order to make them both the same group. Dr. S. Lewis Johnson, former professor of Greek and New Testament exegesis at Dallas Theological Seminary, has done a detailed study of Galatians 6.16 in his introduction. Johnson makes the following observation. In spite of the overwhelming evidence to the contrary, there remains a persistent support for the contention the term Israel may refer properly to Gentile believers in the present age. The primary support is found in Galatians 6.16. I cannot help but think that the dogmatic considerations loom large in interpretation of Galatians 6.16. The tenacity with which the application of the Israel of God to the church is held, in spite of a massive evidence to the contrary, leads one to think that the supporters of the view believe the eschatological system, usually a nominal system, hangs on the reference of the term to the people of God, composed of both living Jews and Gentiles. Amillennialism does not hang on this interpretation, but the view does appear to have a treasured place in Amillennial exegesis. In speaking of this view, the they refer the term to ethnic Israel, as since the term Israel has in every other, uh, in more of its more than 65 uses in the New Testament, and in 15 uses by Paul, in tones almost emotional, William Hendrickson, the respect of reform com commentator writes, I refuse to accept this, that explanation. Well, leading up to is expressed neatly by D.W.B. Robinson, an article written about 20 years ago. The glib citation of Galatians 6.16 to support the view that churches in New Israel should be vigorously challenged. 
there is weighty support from a limited interpretation. We can say more than this. In my opinion, there is more than weighty support for a more limited interpretation. There's overwhelming evidence for, this, um, for support for such. In fact, the least likely view among several alternatives is the view that the Israel of God is the church. And uh, he takes the view of the rest of Israel of God is specifically the Jewish believers of the present age. And, you, and I've given you the views as he expresses them in the three key areas of argument um, in the paper. I won't bother reading them. Now we go to the section Romans uh, 9 through 11 and the remnant of Israel. The doctrine of the remnant of Israel teaches there is always a segment of the Jewish people or believers. The Jewish New Testament is that the remnant of Israel today comprise the Jewish believers in the Messiahship of Jesus. In the New Testament, the doctrine is primarily found in Paul's Israelology in Romans 9 through 11. There's one other passage on the remnant of Israel relevant to Israel present, which is in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. I'll just give you a summary. We'll deal with it a bit more in detail shortly. By taking Peter's words in chapter 1, verse 1 to Lily, it's clear that the epistle was not written to the church at large, nor to a body of Gentile believers, but to Jewish believers living outside the land within a majority Gentile population. The term dispersion is a technical Jewish term for Jews to live outside the land. It's used twice elsewhere, which virtually all commentators agree refers to Jews of the diaspora. There's no reason to make first Peter the exception since it fits well into Peter's calling as the apostle to the circumcision. Furthermore, Peter twice makes reference to the fact that the readers live among the Gentiles. While many try to make the term Gentile mean unbelievers, that is neither its Jewish usage nor uh, even the normal New Testament usage as a simple look at the concordance will show. Peter is using the term Gentile as normal usage meaning non-Jew. Peter is addressing Jewish believers living among a majority Gentile population. Expressions such as vain meaning of life handed down from your fathers have clear Jewish overtones, distinguishing the Jewish believers from their past lives from rabbinic Judaism. In this section of the epistle, Paul, uh, Peter draws a contrast between remnant and non-remnant. His purpose is to show that while the non-remnant has failed in its calling, remnant has not failed. Rexus 19, clearly in his mind, Peter states that Jewish believers, because of the kind of salvation they have, are two things. The first of all, living stones, and so a part of the spiritual house. The spiritual house of um, Israel, remnant of Israel, or Paul's words, the Israel of God, Second, the Jewish believers are a holy priesthood. This too is the calling of the nation as a whole. Nation failed, but the individual has not failed, and are today offering spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. Peter goes on to explain the distinction between the remnant and non-remnant. He begins with the state of the remnant and calls Isaiah 28:16 to point out that the chief cornerstone is the Messiah, who before God the Father is left them precious, so those who believe in him will not be shamed. He then makes the application and states that while the messianic stone is indeed precious, it's only precious for the remnant. Concerning the non-remnant, Peter quotes from Psalm 118 to show him it was already predicted the messianic stone would be rejected by the of Israel. He also quotes Isaiah to show that for the unbeliever, the messianic stone was to be the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense. Isaiah dealt with the contrast between remnant and non-remnant, Peter concludes with the application. Now remnant indeed stumble for those who rejected the word were destined to stumble. Isaiah predicted Emmanuel will be the point of division between remnant and non-remnant. Peter teaches that this has now taken place and Jesus the Messiah has become that point of division. The passage concludes with the further description of the status of the remnant. According to verse five, remnant of Israel comprise a special house and a holy priesthood. With Exodus 19 still in mind, Peter now adds four other descriptions to show that the position of the remnant in contrast to Israel, the whole. First, they are an elect race. This is based upon Isaiah 43:20, being elect shows they were chosen at God's initiative. This is a reference to their individual election. Use of the term race shows that Peter also is dealing with their national election. The church, however, is not a race, but, a comp but composed of believers from all races. Second, the remnant of Israel is a royal priesthood. 
In verse 5, they're called the holy priesthood, emphasizing the right to approach the heavenly city, heavenly sanctuary. Now they're also real priesthood since the high priesthood of Jesus is priest king of the order of Melchizedek. These believers are therefore real priesthood, for they are both priests and kings. For now they are functioning as priests, but in the future they will function as kings and will exercise all of kingly authority in the messianic kingdom. Third, the believing in Jewish remnant is a holy nation. Israel became a nation at Mount Sinai and was called uh, upon to be holy and separate from sin to God. However, the nation as a whole failed, while the remnant has not failed. The church, not a nation, was comprised of believers from all nations. For they are people from God's own possession. This is not, based up, this is not only based upon Exodus 19, also upon Deuteronomy and Isaiah and Malachi. And while they become a nation, they became a nation of Mount Sinai, they became a people with Abraham to Isaac and Jacob. And the uh, remnant is uh, God's own possession for those Jewish believers who were purchased by the blood of the Messiah as uniquely belong to God. To summarize, Peter is not drawing a distinction between Israel and the church or between unbelieving Jews and believing Gentiles. The distinction is between Jews who believe and Jews who do not believe. His point is that while Israel as a whole failed, the believing remnant of Israel has not failed. A remnant of Israel is fulfilling the call of the nation as a whole. And Paul will make the same point in his theology of, his, of uh, Romans 9 through 11. Now, the two Israels are Romans 9 6. In verse 6, Paul states that the next unit with this word but to show he's about to do some explaining. The problem is not that the, whole, uh, that the word of God has come to naught. The word of God or God's promises have failed. The word of God and his promises have not failed. The point is that the word of God has not fallen off its straight course. The straight course is the, plain and perp- the plan and purpose of God. The word of God has not suddenly been frustrated by Israel's rejection. In fact, the rejection by Israel, the messiahship of Jesus, was very much part of the divine program and plan. It expounds and says, for they are not all Israel, they are all of Israel. It's important this verse not be misunderstood. Paul is not distinguishing between Israel and the church, nor between Jews and Gentiles. Rather, he's distinguishing between Jews who believe and Jews who do not believe, or between remnant and non-remnant. The first expression, all this, will refer to the believing Jewish remnant, the natural seed. And the second expression of, of Israel refers to the entire nation, the whole natural seed. What Paul is saying is that there are two Israels, Israel the whole, which is, includes all physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all Jews, and with the nation of Israel, there is the Israel of God, the believing Israel, the true Israel. The contrast is between Jews who believe and Jews who do not believe. There is one Israel which comprises the entire nation, and within a whole nation of physical Israel, there is a spiritual Israel. The spiritual Israel is never stated by Scripture to be the church. Spiritual Israel is always those Jews within the nation as a whole who believe. This way, Paul expounds and elaborates upon a statement made in chapter 2, Verse 28 and 29. Then Romans 11, 1 through 10, rejection by Israel was not total. And the point of this section is to know that God has not cast Israel off. But rather, to prove that, he points himself out to be a believer. And if God has cast Israel off, it means that no Jew could be saved. The fact that Paul is a Jew who believes shows that God has not cast Israel off. But at that point, somebody can say, now, wait a minute, Paul, we know you're a Jew who believes. We even have some Jewish believers here in the Church of Rome, but let's be honest. The vast majority of the Jews rejected the Messiah. Only a small minority believe. And because only a small minority believe shows God must have cast Israel off. And they're using the existence of only a minority of Jews to show God really did cast Israel off as a whole. That's where Paul falls back in the story of Elijah and the 7,000 who believed. In Elijah's day, there may be two or three million Jews in the northern kingdom. Only 7,000 were believers. The southern kingdom probably had more than that, but northern kingdom down to 7,000. Elijah make it 7,001. That was it. And yet nobody was saying that God has cast his love back then. By the same token, in place of using the existence of only a minority who believe, as evidence that God has cast his love, the existence of the minority, no matter how small, even happens to be down to one, is evidence that God has not cast Israel away. And the existence of a minority, no matter how small, 
shows God still has a program for Israel. So the point of verses 1 through 10 then is that while Israel as a nation has failed to attain righteousness, this rejection of the Messiah of Jesus is not a total rejection because there are Jewish people who do believe, and these Jewish believers have attained the righteousness of God, but attained it by grace and not by, by means of their works. And therefore, the existing minority will show that God has not cast Israel away. Then the paper of a section in Remnant of Israel during the future time of the tribulation. I won't read this, but it points out that Remnant will continue right into the tribulation. There will be Jews coming to faith in that period of time. We come to Israel's national salvation, Romans 11, verse 25 to 36. Here he points out that the, uh, the hardening of Israel at this point of time is first of all partial, and of course it's partial, always be Jews coming to faith, but secondly it's also temporary until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Once the fullness of Gentiles has come in, then the whole nation will come to faith and there will someday be a national salvation of Israel that will finally result in God fulfilling all his covenantal promises to Israel. Now skipping down to the remnant of Israel and the old Israel, according to Romans 11, 25 to 27, all Israel will be saved. And according to Isaiah 10, 20, 23, only remnant will be saved. Now this is not a contradiction if it is understood in the context of Israel's national salvation. As Zechariah 13 points out, two-thirds of the Jewish population will be destroyed in the, persec in the persecutions of the tribulation. This will include the entire non-remnant so that only the remnant will survive as the escape of Israel in Isaiah's prophecies. So the remnant is, uh, so many one-third become believers. At that point, all this will, the remnant of Israel, become one and the same. As Micah 2, 12 and 13 makes clear using Hebrew poetry and parallelism, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of you. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. And not the all of you and remnant of Israel are one and the same. For with this was national salvation, the whole nation will now come to part of the remnant. And because of this national salvation, Messiah will then return to rescue them. You have a section on the remnant messianic kingdom, which I won't bother reading. Let's go now to the remnant and non-remnant of 1 Peter 2. It should be kept in mind that Peter is writing to Jewish believers throughout, script, uh, throughout Scripture, there are always two Israels. Israel, the whole that comprises all Jews. Israel, the remnant that comprises only believing Jews. Here, Peter distinguishes between the remnant and non remnant. Replacement theology, however, relies on um, this passage as proof that true Israel is the church. And in the paper, you have a number of examples where quote replacement theologians to try to make that connection. The argument goes like this. Peter uses terminology of the church that the Old Testament used of Israel. And therefore, that shows that the church has replaced Israel. Again, the terminology used by most of the prophets about Israel is used by Peter to the church. And therefore, the church has replaced Israel. And um, as I point out in um, this segment, first of all, again, that Paul never, uh, Peter never says he's writing to the church per se, but writing to dispersion to Jewish believers. And furthermore, he also um, is writing specifically to Jewish believers who are members of the remnant, and therefore letters addressed to remnant per se. He's not saying that the church has replaced Israel. He's saying that where Israel has failed, the remnant of Israel has not failed, and continues to carry on Israel's original calling. Now, in the section on chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, this is a favorite passage for those who teach replacement theology. As I mentioned, they claim that that's where it shows the church has replaced Israel based upon the same terminology. And even, and even though some dispensationalists do also refer to 2 Peter 2, referring to a church, they, they reject going as far as replacementism does and do believe these referring really to the Jews who believe. But... In, um, to, to, um, they do not uh, make the church the new Israel. But in actuality, we keep in mind that behind all of this, the remnant concept of the Old Testament, then we get to understand these writings specifically to the Jewish remnant of that day that continues to this day in Romans 11, verses 1 through 10. And um, again, the point is, which was a nation has failed, the, um, 
Remnantus was not filled, fulfilling this was calling to this day. Now, I will not uh, read this whole section. I'll give you a more detailed exposition of chapter two, verses one through 10. Now, the last thing to note is the two passages where the term Gentile is used. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 11 and 12, he mentions their behavior seemingly among the Gentiles. And again, the personality wants to make the Gentiles here merely unbelievers. But again, that's not the way a Jew would often would ever use the term Gentile, unless it's rather obvious like Paul does in 1 Corinthians 12. But in this context, where the apostle of the, to the circumcision, writing to members of the believing circumcision, it's natural for him to use Jewish terminology, and therefore, the word Gentile simply refers to non-Jews among whom they live, and they have to share how they live with in the testimony among the Gentiles among whom they live. And then the second passage is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses, uh, chapter 4, verses 3 through 6, but especially verse 3, where it talks about the conduct of the Gentiles. Here again, replacement theology commentaries, they try to make this simply unbeliever, and Peter's audience is primarily Gentile believers. But that would again violates the normal usage of the term. There's nothing here to imply. He means something other than merely non Jews. So, Going now to the conclusion, it's important that a proper systematic theology first goes back to the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and get a clear understanding of the remnant of Israel. Once that is understood, it will be far easier to see and understand how New Testament writers have the concept of minds they portrayed all of the remnant of Israel today, connection with Israel as a whole and with the church. I think that's where First Peter is certainly true in this unique way. Now, we didn't do the whole paper for obvious reasons, the lack of time. you find the more complete details um, in your uh, computer there, and also more details in two of our books. One is what's called the Messianic Jewish Epistles, which is a commentary on Hebrews, James, First Peter, Second Peter, Jude. And the material is found in the book is Rology, which deals with uh, the a dispensation of theology, all the Bible is about Israel, theologically, past, present, and future. Okay, I promised to close with a second round by a story from Helm, so I'll tell you a shorter one. The synagogue school was growing, and there were more and more children coming into the, uh, to the synagogue school, and so they had to expand the, um, the uh, school uh, building. Papa hired some local workers in the helm to do the expansion work. And as they were working, the rabbi decided to go outside to see how they were doing. And um, he noticed what one worker was doing. He pulled out the nail from his back and looked at it and hammered the nail in. He pulled a second nail and looked at it and threw it away. So some nails he hammered in, but some nails he threw away. Rabbi asked him, why are you throwing these good nails away? The man says, well, when I pull them out of the bag and look at them, sometimes they put their head at the wrong end of the nail. I can't handle it that way. <laughs> Rabbi said, no, no, you don't understand. These are for the other side of the building. <laughs> well, it's kind of my regular Rabbi's story. There's a logic. The logic doesn't quite work right. That's the common story, the common element of Rabbi's stories. Okay, any questions?